times, you're welcome to use the chat function as we go throughout to ask some questions and to introduce yourself. This is actually the second webinar, uh, second of two that Sport New Zealand is hosting. Uh, Sport New Zealand doing that as part of their commitment to uh, the communities and supporting partner boards develop and sustain good governance. Uh, the first webinar that we had last week was excellent. Uh, it was how to ensure your board was appealing to women and that can be viewed on Sport Tutor and Rachel may add that into the chat, that link there at some stage. Um, today we're focused on how to appoint exceptional board members covering key elements to give you as uh, board members the chance to recruit and retain, retain great talent, especially as it's becoming uh, increasingly competitive. We are recording today's session so that it will be up on Sports Tutor for further viewing later on. So Julie, welcome along. Oh, kia ora, Tato. Thanks, Simon. Uh, ko Julie Hood Tukawingwa. Lovely to be here. Uh, topic um, close to my heart is the one about women in governance. I'm the governance and planning consultant at Sport New Zealand, if you don't know, and I lead the women in governance program. And kia ora. Uh, for those who don't know, my name's Simon Telfer. Uh, I do a lot of board uh, recruitment. I also set up the Appoint Better Boards community in partnership with Sport uh, New Zealand about 10 or so years ago has 18,000 members and we're very proud of that. I do a lot of board uh, work for uh, Sport New Zealand and some of the associated organisations. The next slide sort of shares some of those uh, entities that uh, we've helped put board members into and done a lot of work with, uh, particularly with helping facilitate women under boards uh, to show that this isn't all historical. As of today, I've just gone live with the Swimming New Zealand board role and next week we'll be going live with uh, Sport Tasman as well. So. Uh, yeah, thanks uh, Thanks to Sports New Zealand for the, the work that uh, I've helped them with over the years. So today we're going to focus on, uh, on recruiting great board members and we're going to try and align that with the three phases within the nine steps to effective governance and that's needs assessment, then it's some a little bit more around the technical recruitment side of things and then the final part of the session will be uh, around succession planning. Uh, Rachel will kindly put some links and some notes in the chat, so keep an eye on that as we go through as well. So the first uh, theme within this needs assessment uh, is to build your board for to tomorrow, not for today. And th that theme, I encourage you to look in at that in, in two ways. Firstly, maybe slightly more conceptually, ask that question, where is, where is your organisation heading? And where are the opportunities and where are the challenges? What's the impact we want to make in our community over the next two or three years and why are we not there yet? Therefore, you know, the skills and experience uh, and demographic uh, demography as in who you have on your board and ways of thinking is really important. It's not just to fill the gap of the departing board member. It's really thinking about where this organisation is going. So building that board that's going to help us get to where we want to get to, not just fill the gap that we have today. The second thing around this sort of theme is uh, probably slightly more practical, and that's to sort of look forward and go, well, look, yes, we've got a vacancy at the moment, but what, who's coming off the board in that next appointment cycle? So looking sort of two years out, and is there a woman leaving, and is that going to make some of that gender imbalance come back again? Uh, and especially around chair succession, you know, we might have a vacancy today, but if the chair's due to rotate Tate off in 12 months time or 24 months time, where is that, where's the chair succession coming from within the board? Who's the deputy chair? And if not, can we bring in uh, some experience and some skill sets to help fill a future role, not just today's role? Second theme that I have around uh, this needs assessment is some of the challenges that we've got around constitutional constraints. Now I've seen, yeah, there's been some challenges I've seen when recruiting, when the when the constitution's possibly been maybe a decade old, often more than that, and it throws up some challenges. And sometimes I see a, like a really prescriptive recruitment process in that constitution, and it doesn't really reflect current technology or current recruitment practices. The timeframes that have been stipulated often are very detailed and they're really difficult to meet. Um, sometimes I refer to some antiquated application methods, including forms, and busy people <laughs> don't want to fill out forms. 
So that's a, just a way of thinking, OK, if, uh, how can we change that constitution? So maybe that if there is reforms required, you know, we can, can we use screening questions instead? Or can we save the forms until we get shortlisted candidates? Often the constitution will have the CEO at the centre of the appointment process, and that's that's not best practice. And finally, it asks, the constitution asks for really large appointment panels to be put in place. Board appointment panels are great, but when they're really large, they become really unwieldy. So I've seen that cause, you know, there's often a logistics challenge putting the board appointment process together or panel together as opposed to actual recruitment process. So while progress is made in the sector, I encourage you, if you're ever looking at doing a constitutional change for another reason, maybe look at how your recruitment uh, board appointment processes are outlined in your constitution. And we've done a lot of work with uh, Nigel Gibson, Nigel uh, from Gibson Sheet, and there's a, a pretty good sort of drop in constitutional uh, set of uh, um, clauses around the board appointment process that could be helpful to you. Julie, uh, any areas for further learning in this particular uh, part yeah. of the discussion? Thanks, Simon. I think the um, new incorporated societies act and the regulations that are due out in the next couple of months are a really timely opportunity for boards to take a look at their constitutions, um, make sure that they are contemporary, including clauses around best practice recruitment, um, make sure that it's written in plain English and it's simple to read and understand to your point, Simon. Um, the Act, as everybody will probably know, really adopts uh, the governance standards found in the Companies Act. So good systems, policies and processes around um, all governance functions, including recruitment, will mean that you can give yourself your best chance to att att attract and retain the talent you need to progress your strategy and your organisation forward. Uh, this is particularly important for um, organisations that have a mix of appointed and elected members. Uh, all board members have to understand the importance of all of this. So uh, Sport New Zealand will be coming out with some updated templates so you don't need to reinvent the wheel in a couple of months' time, including a, a very um, simplified version for clubs where really they do need the most help. The third area, thank you, Judy. The third area we wanted to talk about in this sort of opening theme and uh, set of themes is the elected member process. And, you know, my experience uh, and observation are that the, the elected member process can be a bit of a lottery and doesn't necessarily help build a cohesive board. And while this isn't always avoidable, it can be mit mitigated in, in a few ways. Uh, there, there is certainly a movement towards uh, the board appointment panel giving guidance to members um, or the board giving guidance to members about what's actually required around the board table rather than just leaving people to guess around that experience and that knowledge and that diversity that's required. So if, if you're not overt around that, then we are leaving it to chance. Uh, there's been a big movement in the last uh, few years and will continue to be so around advertising elected roles. Yes, it goes go to the membership and it does go through internal comms, but it should also be going out to that constituency of people that are uh, able to be elected, but aren't actually tapped into the, to the current uh, internal comms at the moment. And this is challenging, but if you can sort of sequence your elected process to come after your, so come first, and then your appointed process follows, it's really good to fill the gaps. So if you can, the elected people come in and they go, great, that fills in gap one and three, we've still got gap two and four, and that's when the appointed process can help uh, supplement that. So again, make your constitution work hard here, uh, formalising both the elected and appointed processes through the BAP, uh, and being able to make recommendations to the AGM is, is likely to get the best people result uh, in place. Julie, any ideas around maybe what elected members can do when considering putting up their hands for a board? Yes, um, I think, um, well, I think there's two sides to this. this. The elected member process really is where the board has to step up and lead, and it's a communication opportunity. So this isn't, um, you know, I'm the next one up to go on the board or I've got a pet project or a main issue and I'm going to get in and lobby for that. This is an opportunity for the board to engage widely with elected members to say, A, your in-depth 
let's say sport knowledge is invaluable and we need it. Uh, we have a strategy, here it is. This is where we think we wish the organisation to go in this time frame. These are the gaps around our board table as we see them. Can you assess yourself against those and see what you have that may be able to really help us get to where we want to, to go rather than I'm going to get on the board and uh, lobby for my pet project. Um, alongside all, all of that uh, for elected members, um, if, you, if most elected members, often not all, are starting out in their governance career, it doesn't mean they can't go onto the board, but come with a learning mindset. Enormous resources on the Sport New Zealand website, including Governance 101. And if I was an elected member for the first time, I would have participated in that, completed it before my interview to make sure if I'm getting one, to make sure that um, I can speak about my learning appetite, you know, that I want to, I want to govern well. And I think the other thing too is understand as a, a minimum the distinction between governance and management and how to bring your operational expertise to governance discussions and conversations, not operational discussions and conversations and heaps of learning um, organisations and material out there for the elected members to um, to take up. Final theme before we kick on to sort of some more nuts and bolts around recruitment is, is board remuneration. And I raise this because I'm really conscious that play and active recreation sport organisations are built on a foundation of volunteers. But sort of interestingly enough, you know, the two roles that I said that I'm recruiting uh, as, as we speak, Swimming New Zealand have uh, uh, made the move to well, they've certainly identified that to attract, uh, you know, a greater gender balance and uh, maybe those that can lead the te ao Māori conversation around the conversation, et cetera, that maybe remuneration needs to be part of that mix to really attract people. And Sport Tasman, that I'm doing the board work for, have just passed a motion to uh, remunerate their board members as well. So I, I see that, you know, that's firsthand, that's just happened in the last uh, couple of weeks. So we know that board roles uh, are getting more complex and the risk is increasing as is the time commitment. So sometimes even modest remuneration can help unlock board talent uh, that might for individuals that might not apply otherwise. Um, you know, it's really important for board members to offset costs like childcare and uh, travel to meetings and the like as well. My recommendation is if funds are limited, you sort of maybe consider giving less to more. And then what I mean by that is if the chair is doing the majority of work and a lot of the heavy lifting, maybe rather than spreading it out across eight different board members, maybe there's an opportunity to remunerate the chair, uh, given that they are, you know, that often they are doing a, a lot of the work. Now, these are not are just my personal views. Um, they are not Sport New Zealand's views or policy, but I just would really continually encourage you to have the conversation rather than remuneration just being one of those enduring no-go areas. Julie, where do you think the, the sector might be at on this particular mm. topic? Yeah, I think the sector is quietly moving. Not everybody, um, but in 2018-19, I interviewed over 40 chairs and asked specifically asked them a question about remuneration, and with one or two exceptions, no one had an appetite for it, but did we're really interested in having the opportunity to provide training and development, governance training and development. I think that continues, and there are a range of cost-effective ways where boards can um, provide um, governance training. And it is interesting to see that the shift is coming now for remuneration. I think the third thing is, you know, we're sitting in the middle of the great resignation, and that will include people divesting uh, governance roles, I, I am predicting, because, um, it's busy out there, uh, people want a balanced life and they'll be targeting their activities to where the best bang for the buck goes, as well as time and contribution. And if we want talented people sitting around our not-for-profit sector boards, we're going to have to think about doing things different and I think we're going to have to think about money. I'd encourage you to keep using the chat to uh, just to view some of the links that Rachel is putting in uh, as, as well as ask any questions and we'll try and weave those <laughs> in uh, during this conversation, but there will be a, a more uh, substantive Q&A session when we get to the to the to the end. So the next uh, section, we talked about the needs assessment, which was just covered. Let's get into the rec recruitment phase as we sort of align ourselves with the nine steps to effective governance and the 
Uh, the key one here is who runs that appointment process. Um, this may be outlined in your constitution, but sometimes you do typically, or typically you do have discretion around who's on that board appointment process or board appointment panel. A couple of ideas here to share with you that might resonate is if you seek diversity around your board table, then it's really important that your panel is diverse. Not only for what it shows and, and, and showing that you're walking the talk, but I have been in a number of panels where the intention is to bring diversity, but when it comes to the crunch, they shy away from it. And I feel like a diverse board panel does actually make sure that the decisions that are made end up being the appointment of uh, what the organisation actually needs. Refresh your board appointment panel. Uh, I used to do a lot of work with New Zealand Rugby League and I did that for three years and then I stepped away even though I wanted to keep helping. I just didn't think it was valuable having someone in there for a fourth term. So my recommendation is every three years or three years is enough time to ser serve on a board appointment panel. Uh, and then uh, otherwise the board appointment panel can tend to make the same type of appointments year in, year out. Uh, it's always healthy to have BAP board appointment panel members that are independent of the sport. I think that's becoming common practice, more common practice. So I'd encourage that to happen. And talking about best practice, look, it's, it's not healthy for the CEO to be involved. Um, the board is there to uh, monitor and to mentor and to encourage and to employ the CEO. I just don't think it sends the right message there uh, when they're either part of the appointment process or even sort of receiving applications. So I think they, they, they should typically sit outside that process. Julie? Uh, yes, I agree. Um, starting from the back and working forward, the CEO's got enough to do. Um, so uh, there's uh, there's some interesting conversations happening in the Northern Hemisphere around uh, roles like the Chief Governance Officer sitting around a board table. I'm not recommending that we all suddenly rush to have one of those, but the Governance Mark program now has the equivalent of a person like that, a dedicated board member, not the chair, who also has enough to do to run systems, policies and processes for the board, like the governance machinery of governance. Um, and that director could arguably take a lead in running the appointment process and making sure that it's, um, that it's smooth and meets the needs of everybody. Um, probably that's all I've got to say around that one, um, Simon, at this point, except to just re reassure, reinforce. I think you can have too much policy systems and processes, but if you've got none, then you really are in, re in the recruitment aspect doing not doing yourself a good service. Jackie, you, you asked a question on the chat uh, around uh, as soon as you start remunerating board members, just going back to our slide, then maybe the health and safety obligations or liabilities are triggered because of that remuneration. I'm not sure that's true and someone like Craig Fisher who's on the call might want to just duck in with that. I don't think remuneration makes any difference as to whether you're an officer of an organisation or a, an office holder and whether health and safety applies there. So I'd certainly check that out. I'm pretty sure that uh, when you are in a position uh, of responsibility, uh, it's, it doesn't matter whether you're remunerated or not. Let's go on to timeframes and candidate care uh, here. And, and again, getting a little bit more practical, we wanted to make sure we talked about conceptual matters on this call, but we are on this web, webinar, but also get down to just a little bit of detail as well. Um, my experience is that organisations don't tend to leave sufficient time for running the process, and often it is you know, it gets towards the crunch time and then shortcuts have to be taken. Not healthy. Uh, nine steps to effective governance outlines. The process should start four months before the AGM and I'm pretty comfortable with that. If you're running a, a, a process, four months seems right to me. I encourage that you set your shortlisting dates and your interview dates at the start of the process. It's really great to give candidates visibility. Uh, that you know you're going out and say advertising on this date and interviews are scheduled for this date. Uh, it shows that the process has some structure to it, has some time frames to it. Uh, appointees actually tend to keep that free in their diary as well. So when it comes to shortlisting and organising interviews, uh, it makes things a lot easier as well. And we know that particularly when you get independent people or anyone on board appointment panel diaries can get filled up. So, you know, as soon as you start that process, lock the dates in. I also encourage applications to close on a specific date. Sporting organisations are pretty good at doing this, saying it will close in three weeks time on X date, as opposed to being 
those roles you see, you know, open until, until filled. Nothing worse than open until filled. One, it's just human nature. There's no call to action because there's no specific date there. And then what if I express interest in six weeks' time and you're already most of the way through the interview process? It's just not good. It's just not effective for efficient use of people's times and causes, um, you know, poor brand reputation there. When you've shortlisted, some organisations have a tendency not to let anyone know that's applied until actually appointment's been made. But as we talked about, that could be three months down the track. So once you've suggest you've selected your shortlist, I would go, you know, I encourage you to go back immediately and say, well, thank you for expressing interest. Unfortunately, you haven't been successful at this time. Please keep in touch, et cetera, there, rather than keeping everyone in a uh, holding pattern with no communication while you go through the rest of the process. There we go. That, that's pretty much around some strong sort of brand reputation uh, type techniques um, there. Judy, I think other what you're, yeah, yeah, I think what you're also saying, Simon, is be professional, like run the process professionally. And even if candidates are not successful, they'll have a much better experience of the board. They'll get a sense that the board knows what it's doing, that it's got good, he understands what good governance is all about. And so they may well be, um, you know, amenable to sitting on a kind of a short long list for future opportunities. And they'll certainly speak positively about their experience rather than negatively and may have another look later. Mm. Um, typically, I think it's getting better, but typically um, many of the sector processes are a bit rushed. And the risk, of course, in rushing is that you don't read the CVs properly, you don't make decisions properly, and you may make the wrong decision. So four months is a really good time frame to do that properly. As we go through the recruitment process, we've got to identify the requirements of the appointee. Sometimes I get asked and say, oh, Simon, can you send through a, a, a board skills matrix for us to complete? And what worries me a little bit about that is it's a little bit of a checkbook exercise, you know, a check, checkbook exercise. People don't pay me that much. Uh, it's a checkbox exercise. <laughs> but, yeah, and I do get worried that, oh, you want to have one lawyer, one accountant, you know, one person that knows the sport, one person that knows governance. And, you know, and, and the majority of times, you know, it, it fits OK. But I'd much rather start from a little bit of a blank piece of paper rather than the obligatory checkbox or checkbook uh, approach. So some of the questions that I, I pose when starting the recruitment process is, again, what skills and experiences required around the table to deliver the strategy, referencing back to build the board for tomorrow and not for today? Yes, we need to look at what skills, so let's manage that against what skills or measure that against which skills and experience we're losing from the board because it's being replaced but always looking out further first. We need to, particularly supporting organisations, we need to get that balance between having everyone around the board steeped in experience about the sport and the, you know, and being passionate about that sport. I'd like to term it as people have got to, on the board have to have an affinity for the sport. I don't think everyone now around the table needs to be an ardent fan or an ex-high performance athlete or had you know three generations of the family in the sport, but then again, I also question when it comes to the interviews. You know, why are you motivated to apply for this role? I think there's got to be some link there, but it doesn't have to be steeped in experience. It's worthwhile looking at the board and saying, how do we currently think as a collective, and what type of thinking would supplement this? Are we quick to make decisions, and maybe someone that's a little bit more you know, thoughtful, be, you know, and a little bit more reserved be helpful? Or do we never get round to making decisions? So it would be great to have someone there that is actually uh, slightly more of an activator in making, making that happen. What demographic attributes or diversity would strengthen the board? I think this is becoming much more common and that's been led by the, uh, the, the women in sport uh, and the, the rebalancing the, the gender makeup on the board. Some of the softer skills, not just the way you think, but the traits and characteristics and qualities uh, that would add to the board. Um, I'm really conscious about using the word what's fit. Uh, I think that concept of fit is dated. It's very subjective. I think what could add to the board is much more a healthy way of who would fit into the board. So again, I just uh, caution against this being a checklist exercise and uh, really starting asking some of those foundational questions when you embark on the recruitment process. Attracting board members. 
I mean, that's, you know, that's where the rubber hits the road, isn't it? That, that's when, you know, we can go through all this, but if we're not actually getting people into the choice set, then uh, everything else is, is, is quite moot. So I always ask the organisations when I've bought in to recruit one question, and that's why would a busy, capable person join this board? I think sometimes we lose a little bit of sight that we've been on the board and we know all about it, we're really passionate about it, but how are we going to, how are we going to sell that sizzle? How are we going to put ourselves in the shoes of someone else out there that might be really good for our board but has got competing time pressures? And the way to sell the sizzle is obviously we, we, what's the organisation's aspiration? You know, you can do the aspirational play and get people motivated. I think sometimes you can say, look, our sport's in a bit of trouble. We've got declining numbers. You know, we're, we're losing, say, some relevancy there and, be, and, and people really thrive on that challenge. You know, there's some board members that like a turnaround situation. Who will they be joining with on the board? So if you feel that you've got uh, very capable people around the board table and, you know, that are great to work with, highlight that. Talk about the current board dynamic, particularly if it's healthy <laughs> and collegial and supportive, that, you know, just by putting that out there, you will encourage other people to apply. And as all organisations should have in the sporting arena, do you have the governance mark? And if you do, leverage it, because I know for a fact that uh, those organisations that have uh, codified and have really good governance are really attractive to people that are time poor, but have a lot to add. Make sure the brief is as much detail as possible. Uh, there is certainly from our experience of advertising well over a thousand, probably 1200 board roles on a point bit of boards now, those organisations that put the time into a reasonably descriptive position brief get uh, get more responses and higher quality responses. Use all your channels, use your internal channels and use your external channels like a point better board. So I know that goes without saying. Before I ask Julie uh, some questions around this or throw it open to Julie, just a couple of things I'm seeing in the market at the moment. Uh, and this has been for a while. I see a real reluctance for people to step straight into the chair role of an NSO or an RST or a sporting organisation. It's just a big ask to somebody to come in there, not know anything about the sport, not know anything about the dynamic around the board table, and go straight into that that board uh, into that chair role. So again, I, I'm a real advocate of having the deputy chair position being created with an understanding that when the current chair uh, moves on or retires, that the deputy chair steps into that. And when we talked about as well that not just recruiting for this year but where is that succession around the board table for the chair role? And maybe we should be looking at in this round, even though it's not immediate. Um, second thing I'm seeing is that, as Julie alluded to, there is uh, people are, are reducing the size of their board portfolio, particularly after COVID, and just ensuring that there's enough capacity around the board table for the, those times when boards are in crisis. So that means there is actually the experienced directors are wanting to have fewer roles in their portfolio. The last thing that I've seen is there's a real appetite for intern director roles. Really, they every time we promote them on a point or I'm asked to recruit them, get lots and lots of responses. So just, you know, that's another way of attracting uh, someone else to your board, uh, maybe using it as a channel to a four board position or helping people within the sport. So just if you're not doing that and you feel you've got good governance practices around your board, then I would encourage you to consider uh, the role of an intern uh, director, just like Swimming New Zealand have got two of them on their board at the moment. Julie? Yes, um, Simon, an interesting question here from Bridget. Any comments regarding the ideal term of appointment for a chair? You know, needing stability for the board and chief executive, but often succession planning means the chair has already been on the board for quite a long time or their term's capped. Yeah, it's a really, really good point. Look, I, I think that if a chair hasn't got a term of three years, uh, you, you know, you're missing a little bit of a trick there. And I fully take your board that they might have already done their three year term as, as an independent director or an independent board member. And then I think and then a three year term of chair, you know, that, that to me sounds best practice there. Six years in total on the board and two or three years before going into the three year term with board. You know, it, and we know it's not science, it is art, but that's what I would be aiming for. Um, just one other thing too, Simon, just in terms of professionalism and the advertisement, um, 
we're really encouraging our, our sector boards, particularly the governance mark boards, to get very clear about you know the impact they want to make into the future. So the outcomes and the measures. The advert again is a really and the interaction with board members is an opportunity to demonstrate how mature the governance thinking processes systems application are and if you're thinking about younger board members they'll be particularly interested in the value set that sits in at your statement of strategy what are your values are your values lived you talked about uh, culture around the board table it's really important uh, for younger board members and actually all of us sitting around a board table to know that we're coming into an organization with aligned values that holds up the strategy and therefore the level of discussion and debate um, is more about the future rather than, you know, um, bickering about the in, the interpersonal or the personal. We don't bicker on boards, Julie. Never, never, no. You talk about you bringing <laughs> younger people on boards and that, you know, and, and the next focus uh, on, on this next slide is about attracting exceptional female board members. And we brought this up just, be, uh, you know, for two reasons. One, we ran the webinar uh, a week ago and had some really, that was based on a point better boards going out and surveying through over 200 women and asking them a core question, what would make uh, a sporting board or a play or active recreation board more, more appealing to you? And we got some really, really good uh, responses there. So yeah. I'll come on to that in a second. I, I am a proponent of being quite overt if you're looking at bringing uh, diversity onto your board or and particularly if you're looking at getting that gender balance right and some of the language I put in there is something like and I'll read it out you know sport xyz you know sport hockey hockey New Zealand is committed to having a balanced and diverse board therefore female or younger or those individuals from a certain ethnicity candidates are especially encouraged to express interest so what you're saying there is you're opening the door up to somebody who might be on the fence going, mm, I'm looking at their board, I'm not sure if they'd have ever appoint someone like me. If you're quite explicit about welcoming them to apply, then at least they're on the long list, they get the chance to be on the short list and the chance to be interviewed and be appointed. So we have to have that welcome mat out for them. Just going on to some of the key things, and I won't redo the webinar that we ran from uh, last week, but uh, the, the bullet points on the next slide there are just some of the key themes that we found or key insights from women. Um, they're much more likely to express role, uh, apply for roles when there's other women around the board table. Uh, the advert and the language really appeals. You can run it through a filter to make sure the language you're using isn't subconsciously sexist or uh, male dominated in its language. This comes to Julie's point of, about younger board members and the purpose of the organisation, that if you have signed up and subscribed to the Sport New Zealand Women in Sport strategy, it's really evident that you're actually walking the talk. Your board culture is seen as really inclusive. There's a big yeah. thing, particularly for females and, and uh, them having uh, childcare responsibilities often, as, as fathers do, but a, a lot of women have said, we want to have more flexibility in the meeting arrangements. We don't want the papers to turn up the day before. We don't want meetings always at, you know, five o'clock on a Tuesday, those sorts of things. And, you know, for women, it was really important that good governance practices were evidence and often the uh, governance mark is, you know, is, is the gold standard of that within the sporting organisations. Julie? Uh, yeah, I think all of us need to understand uh, kind of our own unconscious biases when we're sitting around a board table. And from what we heard last at our last webinar, it's important for women to um, to know that they've been heard as well as be heard. So, and and the other thing too that I was reminded about is every it's not just the chair's responsibility to and make sure everybody's voice is included in a discussion. It's everybody around the board table's responsibility to make sure that um, contribution is succinct and that everyone has had an opportunity, whether you're a self-identified woman or man. So um, unconscious bias training, I think, is never a bad thing to do. I think it's a good thing to do for all of us. Um, we talked a bit about emerging direct opportunities. Simon, you made a really good point that don't um, exclude talented young uh, female women talent, men talent, just because they are 
um, young, put them in an emerging program, they may well be very good contributors as a full board member around the board table. I think that's important. Um, and uh, no, I think that's all I've got there. Thank you. Do you want to talk about how the National Policy for Gender Equity is tracking? Yes, yes, I can do that. Um, Why don't we do that now? Why don't we just give everyone just a brief uh, update? Super, yep. So uh, sits under the Women and Girls Strategy. Uh, everyone needed to comply by December 2021. 65 out of 66 boards got there, most of them on their own, which I think is just an awesome um, effort all credit to the sector. Before we set where to next, I've commissioned a review of the Sport New Zealand's work in this space from 2011, when we first started monitoring board gender, through to December 2021. And as part of that, interviewing chairs and interviewing women who have been appointed onto boards during the time that we set the target, to December to get a, a just a sample set of whether this has been, to your point, a checkbox exercise or a tick box exercise, or have we, because we think intuitively that we have, started to lock in some pretty awesome change in the way um, boards are integrating broader diversity. Uh, in their recruitment processes and their inclusion process. So there'll be recommendations coming from that. And then a plan ideally out to 2032 uh, for women in play active recreation sport governance, which sits alongside the current Sport New Zealand strategy. Watch the space. Yeah, and appreciate the hard work that you're doing in championing that internally. Uh, Julie, it's amazing. Just before we finish up here, just uh, on uh, women and uh, if you want to attract uh, really capable uh, people to your board, and they happen to be, you know, and just because they happen to be women, we, on a point, we've set up the Women in Play Active Recreation and Sports Governance uh, subgroup there. We have about 220 women from across Aotearoa. They are all interested in board positions. That's what, uh, sorry, in sport yeah. positions, yes, and in sport positions. They're all available to connect free of charge, and we've done that for for the sector. Uh, a lot of them have videos as well, so you can get a really immediate sense of the individual. Um, Rachel, just go to that next slide for Prabha there. You can see the two videos there. I'd say about 90% of individuals have the videos. It's just a great way of getting a sense of how they can contribute, uh, just the way that they're thinking, uh, how they would be an add to the board. So that Women in Sport Governance, uh, 200 plus women, 220 available on a point better boards. So we've only got one more slide before we go into the Q&A session. And I know, Julie, you'll be looking through that to actually just go back that one slide there. Yep. Uh, Julie, you'll just have a look through at the chat so that we can have a really a robust yes. Q&A session as well. Yes. And uh, just being a little bit conscious of time, we the, the key things here around succession planning we'll just touch on. Um, and, and, and here's some thoughts, and Julie might elaborate on these. Look, a comprehensive induction really sets the tone for a board appointment. I can't stress that enough, that if someone goes in and they just sort of happen to be in their first board meeting and then all of a sudden they're part of the board and they really never got that foundational knowledge, I think you really need to invest time up front to get the best out of an appointee. So don't skimp on the induction. On the alternate, on the other end of the side, you know, exit interviews can be a really effective way of informing skills matrices or maintaining a healthy board dynamic. I know sometimes it can be uncomfortable, we never get round to it. It's really good to get an independent person to do it, someone who's got infinity with the organisation but isn't the board chair. Just to have a half an hour chat, you know, what, what are some of your observations, what some of your learnings, what some of your leave behinds uh, as you depart the board. Good chairs in particular maintain relationships with prospective directors year in, year out. Okay, so not just thinking about board appointment during the four months leading up to the AGM. So you're always having your radar open and having, you know, building relationships with individuals and when the time's right, encouraging them to express interest. And that candidate care thing we talked about, about getting people back, getting back to people uh, as soon as their decisions are made around whether they made the shortlist or not, putting in when the interview dates are, just all that good stuff just builds up really good brand recognition, really good user ex customer experience. That means that even if they're unsuccessful this time around, 
when they develop their governance career in a couple of years, they still think of that particular organisation with a great light, and you know they might be good. Uh, their 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 background and skills might be right for the organisation at that time. Julie. Yes, um, just one point, and then there's a cracker of a question here from Tracy, which will lead us into this um, discussion a bit more, is that I'd go back to what I said before, because there's so much for boards to do on an annual basis anyway, and the chair's got enough to do, and your chief executive's got their own role. If you're going to allocate someone with a responsibility for the governance functions, the systems, policies, and processes, there's an ideal person to keep an eye on the induction and retention program, and you could ideally um, or arguably pick up the governance development functions in that role because we have high expectations of our chief executives to appoint and uh, retain and develop people in our organisations and I think it's exactly the same thing around a board table and it's typically not been done well but increasingly I think our boards in the sector are starting to think more broadly especially those in the governance smart program but not exclusively about um, what is the best way to retain um, great people who have got a passion for what they're doing and are contemporary in their thinking? So an identified person doing that, I think, would be useful. Going back to, and thanks to Fiona McDonald, who uh, just on my cursory glance here, you've answered that question around here, around the uh, health and safety uh, works through WorkSafe, uh, volunteer officers, officers, cannot be held liable if they fail in their duty of diligence, in their due diligence duty. A volunteer is defined as X, Y, Z. So look, uh, maybe I wasn't as currently up to speed in that legal side of things. This is a seminar around board appointment processes uh, as opposed to the implications of remuneration. So thanks for pointing that out. Uh, I will go and do some uh, digging there, uh, but it is something to be aware of. So thanks for those who raised the question and then clarified that as well. Simon, Julie. Tracy's got a good question here. Do you see any value in board appointments panels focusing on director officer selection recommendations being also extended to capture director development, evaluation, succession planning, etc. as well? So more a board development committee perhaps chaired by the deputy chair. What do you think, Julie? Well, I think that top of mind, I, I think keep the, the appointment panel doing its um, its job, but separately thinking about possibly a governance board committee because boards can have a governance committee um, as well as an audit and finance, audit and risk committee, they're the two main ones, and extend the governance committee terms of reference into something more broader. I, I, I could be, I mean, people could argue the toss, but um, I think the recruit, the board appointments panel process has got its own discrete role. Um, and um, and I'd have two. Yeah, I'd separate I, I, it out. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree. With you. As soon as you start broadening out those terms of reference, you do lose yeah. focus on on uh, the task at hand. The task at hand is to ensure that the you know the, the best people available at the moment are bought and attracted, inducted, selected, brought into the organisation, uh, and often within sport organisations, when you're getting independent people part of the appointment panel, they're not remunerated. There is a quite a big call on their time, like for the roles that we've got coming up, that will be probably two days elapsed time in total, a day for the interviewing and a day for everything before, you know, to then broaden that out and expect them to be contributing more widely than that. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it might be just a bit much of an ask. The one thing the um, board appointments panel could do, though, is they could listen for feedback from the uh, candidates and or questions. And if there's anything relating to training and development opportunities, feed that back into the subcommittee looking at it. So you've got a way of saying, I don't have to, we don't address it now, but that's good feedback for the board to know that if increasingly um, directors are wanting this, then, then that needs to be provided in some way. If you have more questions, just put them into the chat uh, as as we head to the to the top of the uh, uh, of the webinar. Simon, I've got one for you. No, um, Julie, what's you your me. what's your no? I think you know this one. What's your view on you know traditionally you would see around 
play active recreation and sport boards, um, legal expertise, accounting expertise, possibly marketing communications expertise, especially in the smaller organisations that don't have the capacity in the uh, operational team. What trends are you seeing in different skill sets coming into board rooms, if you're seeing any? And if you're not, where would you recommend our boards start to think of in terms of their skills matrix, what should they be looking for if it's a contemporary organisation looking at quite a different future than, say, 50 years ago? Uh, and this wasn't a patsy question because I am having to think about this one. I, I think that legal skill set around the table is, is a much less than it used to be. I, I, I don't see that very regularly at all. I think that concept you can buy in that legal advice, I, you know, the accounting and finance, there is always the need, and I'm yet to see an organisation that doesn't want to have someone who can lead the conversation around accounting, risk, finance, around the, the, the board table. So I think that's a little bit of a given as it stands at the moment. Legal, not so much. I'm seeing a lot around commercialisation of assets, so digital assets, uh, and looking at different business models and commercialisation and funding streams. I think that that crossover between whether it is digitally related or marketing related or commercial related. That's a, I'm seeing that more and more. I think those that can, I'm conscious of the obligatory stakeholder relationship mentioned, but I think that is often with other aligned organisations within the sector. So for instance, I'll use this because it's front of mind at the moment, Swimming New Zealand want to have a really close relationship with Water Safety New Zealand, with Coast Guard, with Surf Life Saving. OK, but they also want to have a really close relationship with uh, local government and central government. So for them, it's someone that's well connected, externally focused uh, and can build relationships with aligned organisations as well as within the public sector. I think there are probably two that I'm seeing particularly at the moment and one that I'm seeing less of. Now, I think we might have answered most of the other questions as we've gone along. Okay, so Philip has asked a question, you're keen on your thoughts around the induction process. Is this spread across topics and different people on the board depending on their strengths? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good one, Philippa. It doesn't tend to, I mean, I think part of the induction process has been able to build a relationship with other board members. So rather than meeting up for the coffee, I think that's really good if you can say, yes, we want you to have a chat or a Zoom and you'll get to know each other and build that relationship. But maybe you'd like to focus on this aspect of our strategy or this aspect of our organisation. So I think that's the case as opposed to sort of getting the full induction and dividing it up by six and giving everyone a sixth of it each. A lot of the time it is actually the uh, the leadership team or the executive team or the management team that uh, needs to impart a lot of uh, information. Uh, obviously, the chair has a really important role because, um, you know, it goes without saying, because they do are responsible for the board dynamic and for that induction. So, yeah, um, conscious and a volunteer organisation of people's time. So, the other my... thing, sorry, Simon. Yeah. I think the other the other place to go, Philippa, will be the um, board charter or board policies because you should have an induction policy, and that's a you could pull that out and have a discussion around the board table about what good looks like for the board and adapt the policy accordingly. So who's got time? Who the best people are to do this, and then have it locked in in advance of requiring it. Um, that might um, be helpful as well. I think Bridget's raised a question there around, you know, that concept of maybe uh, Bridget comes from a science background and that different way of thinking. And I, I had the pleasure of in a commercial organisation appointing a scientist to a board a couple of weeks ago. And, it, uh, and that lens that they brought, that that viewpoint, that perspective, it was that was in a commercial context as well, but that rigour around and uh, the analytical approach and, and that. Uh, that, that lens was really, really valuable. So definitely get that, Bridget, around that bringing, as I spoke about, that collective thought. How as an organisation do we collectively think? Now, that's really hard to do subjectively. So there is people like Lloyd Mander with the DOT scorecard, that diversity of thought scorecard, which is really, really helpful. Um, not all organisations can necessarily uh, not afford or prioritise the, the budget to go in that area, but it is a, a really good way to say, rather than we think we think this way, here's something that actually objectively measures how we think 
And this is on the spider web. This is where we really are lacking in this particular, I'd say quadrant, but there's more than four areas there. So yes, uh, for some organizations, unfortunately in that position that they just want people to, onto the board. Unfortunately, you know, well, let's be honest, in some sporting organization, as you go down the structure and as you go down the code, you know, it's just uh, to be able to get to that level of nuance around diversity of thinking is actually, oh heck, you know, we'd love to have the, uh, the, you know, the number of people, uh, attract a number of people that we can get down to that level of detail. So I've talked around that a little bit. It is really, really valuable. And if you're in a, uh, a privileged position to be able to, to get that, uh, or to make that a priority, that uh, is, you know, it's very important. Just coming back to before we, you know, if there's any other questions, we'll, we'll give this another couple of minutes. You know, Craig made, made a really good point about, you know, I've done learning today around the, uh, as soon as someone's remunerated, they are held more liable. I'm not sure that, you know, for, for, individual directors that they wouldn't take a role because they, it was less liable. I think those really good board members say, look, there is risk anyway. And often it's more the reputational risk that's more important to me than the potentially around the health and safety. Um, it's not that it's more important. It's, you know, it, I think we can manage health and safety by careful processes and education and having that culture really right. Um, so, yeah, whether it's, just be careful about saying, well, let's not remunerate board members because we're all going to be held to a higher standard. And we should be at that high standard anyway. And then look at those other individuals that go, we could be attracting this sort of skill set or this sort of experience or this sort of demographic if we did just get people on the ladder of being remunerated uh, for their board for their board appointments. And the Incorporated Societies Act has really lifted um the game in terms of that expectation anyway, hasn't it? So I think that horse has bolted to a degree. OK, we're coming up. Yeah, uh, stay with us. Uh, anything in closing uh, before we sign off, Julie? No, thank you for attending. Hope it's been useful and feedback welcome as always. Yeah, very good. This will be up. You will get an email about uh, how you can see this online and share with colleagues. Really appreciate everyone's attention. The numbers have stayed really high. Uh, enjoy the rest of the week and kia ora.